pat ourselves on the back. Theorists. Of course, we can't pat ourselves on the back because, you know, we missed something, right? I just proved to you, I hope, that the universe was open. And, well, I, I thought it was open because I added up all the mass in the universe. Added it up to 30% of what you needed to make a flat universe, but the universe is flat. We're missing 70%. Okay? So that's a problem. But before we do, I, wanna, I just want to mention this other aspect. This image, the data agrees with the observations, or the, the, the theory agrees with the observations, really beautifully, not just because the universe is flat, but this is it because these lumps, and this is called a power spectrum, the, 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 the statistics of these lumps is precisely that which would be expected if quantum mechanics in the early universe, which has produces quantum fluctuations, quantum mechanics says everywhere things are fluctuating on very small scales, if those very small scale fluctuations got, as the universe got puffed up, got frozen in, and became real density fluctuations, they would produce precisely what we see today. If that's true, then you are here, literally, due to quantum mechanics. You are quantum children. <laughs> and I've already talked, I've talked about star children a lot in other cases, but you're quantum children too. So, I suppose if I wanted to be Another, produce another YouTube video or something that someone would record, I could say, forget Jesus, quantum mechanics happened, so you'd be here. <laughs> okay? But I find that amazing, that the quantum mechanics, the, the, the physics of the very small, could be responsible for everything we see. In any case, to get back to the matter at hand, we're missing 70% of the universe. Okay. Where could it be? Well, it turns out, if you put energy, as I've often said, gravity sucks. You all know that who took physics. Everyone here knows that. Gravity always sucks. It always pulls, it never pushes. That's not quite true. It always, all normal types of gravity always pull. But if we put energy, instead of into matter or radiation, into empty space, and by that I mean you take a region of space and you get rid of all the particles, all the radiation, so there's absolutely nothing there. And I mean it, there's absolutely nothing there. If that space weighs something, it'll actually be gravitationally repulsive. Now, of course, it's absurd that that, that empty space should weigh anything, but if it did, it would be gravitationally repulsive. And then, when we look at the expansion of the universe over time, if it was dominated by the energy of empty space, actually, the expansion of the universe would speed up, and not slow down. Now, in 1998, two groups of astronomers, who didn't know what the hell they were doing, <laughs> decided to measure the rate at which the universe was slowing down. And they, well actually, I think I'll just, uh, oh, oh, hold on, I'm going to come back. I, I actually departed from what I thought I'd do. Okay, good. Forget the ignorant astronomers for the moment. Get back to I wanted to, I felt it would be so incredulous about the fact that empty space would have energy that I'd better, I better talk about this a little bit. So, it is insane to think that empty space is going to have energy. It is illogical. It is, um, doesn't make sense. It violates common sense. And the point I often try and make, especially to Christian apologists, is that science doesn't have to respect our common sense. The universe is the way it is whether we like it or not. And if it doesn't respect our common sense, that's a problem with our common sense. Okay? And that's probably the hardest thing to convince people of. Okay? And it turns out that, with that the reason it doesn't respect common sense is that small scales, the universe is governed by relativity and quantum mechanics, two aspects of physics that don't make sense, at least common sense. And when you put them together, it's even worse. And when you put quantum mechanics and relativity together, you find out that at the smallest scales, empty space is not really, well, it has no particles in it, but it's really much more interesting. It's a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles popping in and out of existence in a time scale so short you can't measure them. This is actually not just an animation. It is the result of a mathematical calculation of what the space inside of a proton looks like. These are particles and fields that are popping in and out of existence in a time scale so short we can't measure them. Now that sounds like philosophy, and I won't make any statements about philosophy, <laughs> but it sounds like, let, let me make something, let me, it sounds like theology. It sounds like counting angels on the head of a pin. But it isn't, because these virtual particles, as they're called, while we can't detect them directly, we can detect them indirectly. So they're science. 
And in fact, we, one of the greatest calculations in the last part of the 20th century was to be able to calculate the effect of these particles on a proton. You may have learned, if you've gone to a good high school or a good university, that protons are made of quarks. These particles are called quarks. Three quarks. Well, that's fine, but in fact, if you add up the mass of the quarks inside a proton, what they don't tell you in school, is if you add up the mass of the quarks inside of a proton, they count for 10% of the mass of the proton. 90% of the mass of the proton is, comes from these virtual particles popping in and out of existence. So they have indirect effects which we can determine. And if we don't include them, we get the wrong answer. And if we do include them, we get the right answer. In this case, just to a factor of 10% or so. But in the case of the energy level spacing of atoms, to better than one part in a billion. The best predictions in all of physics come from including virtual particles. So we know they're there. And we know, therefore, empty space is not so simple. Nothing is not what we thought it was before. Okay. Now, we, we're so proud of ourselves for being able to do that, we apply that to the universe. We say, well, let's try and calculate the energy of empty space. And we do, we come up not with the best calculation, but the worst calculation in all of physics. You can't see it, but there's a one there. We come up with the energy of empty space should be roughly a gazillion times the energy of everything we see. 120, 120 orders of magnitude too large. We know that can't be the case because if the energy of empty space were that big, we just wouldn't be here. No galaxies would have ever formed. It would have been, the universe would have been expanding so fast in early times that nothing would have happened. Literally nothing would have ever happened. So, and we knew, and this problem has been around since I've been a graduate student, and it's because it was the worst problem in physics, we never talked about it. <laughs> but actually, we knew. We could go to bed at night because we knew the answer. Theorists. We knew the answer had to be zero. It had to be zero, because first of all, zero is a pretty number. <laughs> and secondly, for another really subtle reason. If it weren't zero, so th then and it would say it wasn't bigger than the energy of everything, all matter in the universe, we'd have to cancel this huge number to 120 decimal places, leaving something non-zero in the 121st decimal place. No one knows how to do that in science. But we can make zero very easily with mathematical symmetries. We can have things that are equal and opposite and cancel exactly. So we figured there was some new symmetry of nature which would make everything simple and make the energy of empty space zero. Because this kind of fine tuning is impossible to imagine. At least in particle physics. But maybe it's not impossible to imagine in astronomy. As I want to point out today because of something that's happening right now. It's hard to imagine two large numbers that have nothing to do with one another, two large things, cancelling almost exactly, but not exactly. It's, it's almost impossible to imagine that happening, in fact. Except for right now. In fact, had it been sunny, and my plan was to let all of you out right now, and, um, and to go outside, because right now, as many of you know, there's an annular eclipse happening right now. If it were just sunny, we could see it, and I was going to insist that we all look at it. Um, but, what, what was that? It's who? Directly at it? You, uh, well, you, you can look directly at it. Um, <laughs> uh, I was given, or people bought for me three pair of eclipse glasses, which were a dollar yesterday, but if it were sunny, I'd be selling them for ten dollars. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but in any case, the point is, here it, it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing. In fact, in many cases, it happens at this kind of year that they don't cancel exactly, they leave a little bit of a ring left over. But there's nothing that said the angular size of the moon and the sun had to be the same. There's no connection between them. It is truly an amazing accident that they're almost the same. And so the fact that we have these beautiful eclipses is an example that maybe unrelated things can sometimes cancel almost exactly and leave something small left over. And that's what exactly we found. Well, what we found is that our idea that they had to cancel exactly and be zero was wrong. What was pretty to us was wrong. And this was discovered about 10 years ago by the astronomers who didn't know what the hell they were doing. <laughs> they were trying to measure this curve of the expansion rate of the universe using things called supernovae. And if I draw a straight line through this data set and bring it down here, what they were trying to do was measure how fast the universe is slowing down, which meant that, it, that, that these distant supernovae would fall along this curve. And they were shocked to discover that it fell above the straight line. Turns out several of us have predicted that, but no one listened. But, but um, I didn't believe it either, even though I predicted it. So, but, uh, 
what, what happens is, if they fall above the straight line, it, it, naively it means the universe is actually accelerating. It's crazy. Except when you ask how much energy would you have to add into empty space to make the universe speed up like it is appearing to be speeding up to fit that data, you have to put exactly what we're missing. If you put 70% of the energy of a flat universe in empty space, then everything works. Everything is in agreement with observation. We live in a flat universe. 30% of the energy of it is in dark matter. 70% of the energy of it is in empty space we call it dark energy. We have no idea why it's there because when we try and calculate, we get the wrong answer. So we have not the slightest idea why it's there, but again, it makes you even more insignificant. <laughs> because now everything we see in the universe, everything in that nice pretty picture I showed at the beginning, is really irrelevant. Because it's less than a 1% bit of cosmic pollution in the universe dominated by dark matter and dark energy. If you got rid of us and the galaxy and all galaxies and everything that we can see with telescopes, you got rid of it all the universe would be essentially the same. So truly, so much for a universe created for us. We are a bit of just pollution. We are relevant completely. That makes it more exciting. Oops, oh no, now I've got to go through this again. I pressed the button in the wrong direction, but it's so pretty. Okay. Let's do that. Okay. Boom. Okay. So, this is the picture of the universe we live in, and now I want to spend um, I, I, guess, I guess about 20 minutes left. The last 20 minutes talking about the consequences of this in terms of nothing. And, and, and um, I apologize for going a little long, but I tried to present this in a way I haven't done before with some wrinkles that people don't normally get to hear about. I hope you at least appreciate that you now are in the fraternity. Anyway, but it's okay. So anyway, the dominant energy universe resides in empty space. And as I said, we have no idea why it's there. And I stress that. No idea. I admit to not knowing, for those people who seem to think that I always write that we know everything. We don't know it. And in fact, as I point out, if anyone came here and lectured saying we knew, knew it, didn't know it, they'd be lying, especially if they're string theorists. Now, it, what it makes it very exciting is that it is probably tied up to the very nature and origin of space, which is why we're so excited to find it there, because it means we don't understand how energy affects gravity at a, at a quantum mechanical level. We, we, we don't understand that, and that's exciting. And as I say, it will also determine our future, and that's not so exciting, as I'll, as I'll mention. It means we live in, in the worst of all possible universes to live in. So much for the uh, universe made for us. Anyway, let me now tell you the real reason that physicists wanted the, or theorists knew the universe was flat, we thought. Because it, one of the things we teach high school students, or at least in Canada they probably still teach high school students, is, is if you take, a, if you take a, a ball or a coin and throw it up in the air, it comes back down, you throw it up faster, it takes longer to come back down, you throw it up really fast, it doesn't come down at all. And then we could calculate that very simply. Take you back to a wonderful time in your life, to high school physics class, and we can say that the energy of that ball has two pieces. A positive piece, we call it the kinetic energy, and a negative piece, we call it the potential energy. And it just becomes bookkeeping. If we throw that ball up fast enough so that the positive piece beats the negative piece, so the total energy is bigger than zero, the ball will escape. If the negative piece beats the positive piece, if the gravitational attraction beats the, 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 the positive piece coming from the speed, the total energy is less than zero. And the coin will, or the ball will come back down. It's just, just bookkeeping. Now what's amazing about the universe is it's exactly the same way. If the universe is the same everywhere, we thought we could determine the future of the universe by just thinking about what... See, if it's the same everywhere, then what happens to one galaxy will happen to all galaxies. So to figure if the universe is expanding forever, we don't have to do any fancy general relativity even. We just have to look at a region of galaxies. We're at the center. These are, as I pointed out, these are not sperm. These are galaxies. And, and, and we look at, at uh, uh, a galaxy at the edge of that region. And it's moving away from us, because the universe is expanding. And the question is, will it come back? And the answer is high school, math, high school physics. We calculate the positive piece of its energy, and that comes from its speed, which happens to come from the expansion rate of the universe, called the Hubble expansion. The negative piece comes from adding up the gravitational attraction of all the stuff in here, including dark matter. That's why we had to know dark matter. That's why I got involved. 
It was only if you include dark matter can you, we thought, get the right answer, and that gives you the negative piece. And if the positive piece beats the negative piece, that means B, uh, sorry, if, yeah, if the, if, sorry, if the negative piece beats the positive piece, so B over A is bigger than 1, then the total energy of this galaxy is negative and it'll collapse in. If the positive piece beats the negative piece, so B over A is less than 1, then that galaxy will go on expanding forever. What is amazing is that actually this ratio is nothing other than this quantity omega, which is related to the curvature of the universe. And we now know omega is precisely 1. We live in a flat universe. But what does that mean? That means B is precisely equal to A. What does that mean? That means the negative piece is precisely equal to the positive piece. What does that mean? That means the total energy, gravitational energy of every object in the universe is precisely zero. Now, if you were creating a universe from nothing, what would you make the total gravitational energy of every object? <laughs> that is telling, and that's one of the telling things that caused me to, in some ways, write the book I just did. Because if we're thinking about how you could create a universe from nothing, it is a remarkable fact that the gravitational energy of every object in the universe that's not empty, but a universe full of stuff, can be zero. That defeats our intuition and our common sense. And the reason these two ignorant guys here the other night <laughs> were saying you can't create something from nothing is because they don't understand things like that. <laughs> the total energy of something could be zero. And that's a profoundly important fact. Okay, so now I want to spend the rest of the time talking about nothing. Well, maybe. Anyway. The first thing, and, and I had to do this in steps in the book at least, because what nothing is such a non-intuitive concept that I think it's really important to talk about. I would argue, and I will refuse ever to, to, to back down at this point, that nothing is a physical quantity, it's not a philosophical quantity. Just like something is a physical quantity. So to understand physical quantities, we actually have to ask the universe. The universe tells us about physical quantities. We don't decide about them by a logic or some, some deep reflection. The universe tells us what nothing is. And I've shown you that nothing is more complicated than you thought. At least this kind of nothing. If you take nothing to be the nothing of the Bible, the nothing of which is an infinite, dark, empty void, empty space, which is a pretty good definition for most people of nothing, that kind of nothing is actually unstable. Because these quantum fluctuations that I talked about are occurring in that nothing all the time. And when you add gravity into the mix, the reason these particles pop in and out of existence, you know, disappear quickly, is if they didn't, they would violate energy conservation. You create two particles, their mass has energy, your know, mass is energy, and you, and you can't, if it started out with zero energy, you can't create real particles that have energy, because you'd violate energy conservation. That's the thing, argument people often use for why you can't create a universe from nothing. But if you have gravity in the mix, if those particles, if the gravitational attraction of those particles is great enough, the negative energy that comes from their gravitational attraction can equal the positive energy that comes from their rest mass, and then they can exist with impunity. And you will be guaranteed in a universe governed by quantum mechanics that empty space will not remain empty for long. Quantum fluctuations will occur, and for long I mean if you're willing to wait a long, long time. <laughs> Quantum fluctuations will occur, they must occur, and gravity will be such that some of those quantum fluctuations will produce pairs of particles that have zero total energy, and those particles continue to exist. So if you wait long enough in empty space, it'll fill itself up. So one of the first answer to the question, why is there something rather than nothing, if your nothing is empty space, is that nothing is unstable. It would be a much more profound question to ask, why is there nothing rather than something? But you wouldn't ask the question if there were, because there would be nothing. <laughs> but nothing can't exist easily on its own. The point is it's not a natural state if your nothing is just empty space. Now, when I say that, some people, as the two people here might have talked about if they had the brains, but I don't think so. They'd say, well, that's not nothing, because that's space. Where did the space come from? And that's not a, I mean, that's a reasonable question. And uh, oh, let, let me stress what I said here, because I think it's really important. There's no contradiction for making real matter appear from nothing. You don't need magic, you don't need superstition, and you don't need any outside power to intervene. 
There's no need for some cosmic intelligence, which I agree with Matt. Why do you go from, from your worries about something for nothing to assume you had to have a cosmic intelligence? It's the same kind of nonsense that leads people to see something strange in the sky and say it's aliens. You know, it's not, it's not a balloon. It's not something. It had to be aliens because it has to be an intelligence. We're hardwired to believe that kind of nonsense. And you don't need an intelligence to create matter from nothing. It happens naturally. Okay. But the second kind of nothing is, okay, what about empty space? Well, it turns out, remember, space and time in, in general relativity are dynamical quantities. Now, if you apply quantum mechanics to those dynamical quantities, and if you had a quantum theory of gravity, which I stress we don't have, but if you did, any quantum theory of gravity space and time would be quantum objects. That means space and time would fluctuate at small scales. And that means you would create not just particles in empty space, but universes. You'd create space itself. And you'd create spaces that would pop in and out of existence at a time scale so short you couldn't measure them. You'd create spaces from where there was no spaces, and time from where there was no time. Which is a much better a uh, definition of nothing, perhaps. You literally not, it's not that I'm talking about vacuum fluctuations in our universe, as some people have argued. We don't even need a universe. Universes can come into existence spontaneously, but most of those universes, like most virtual particles, will pop in and out of existence in a time scale so short you can't see them. The only ones that can persist forever are universes that have zero total energy because they don't violate any rules. Now, it would be oh so simple if everything fit together and I just said, look, a flat universe has zero total energy and that's the universe we live in. That's not so simple. That's not the way it works, unfortunately. Because we can't even calculate the total energy of a flat universe. I told you that the gravitational energy of every object in a flat universe is zero, and that's true. But there's a lot more energy than just gravitational energy. There's rest mass energy. And, and we can't calculate it for a flat universe, which is in principle infinite. The only universe we can actually calculate the total energy of is a closed universe. And a closed universe, it turns out, has zero total energy. But we don't live in a closed universe. Well, most closed universes, as I pointed out, closed universes expand and collapse again if they're full of matter and nothing else. And therefore, most closed universes, it turns out that you create by quantum mechanics, will expand and contract at a time scale on the average of a millionth 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 of a billionth of a second. Too short for this lecture. <laughs> so, we don't live in those universes. What kind of universe could live long enough for consciousness to arise by evolution and ask the question, why is there something rather than nothing? And it turns out, the only kind of universe that could persist is one that for a while was dominated by the energy of empty space at early times. Now it turns out the theories of particle physics that we have, a theory called inflation, predicts precisely that. That for a while, and just a short while, the energy of the universe was dominated by the energy of empty space. And the argument, which again I haven't presented before, is since I'm in Canada, um, it's based on beer. <laughs> Though many, some of you may have had a party and, 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 and bought beer and forgot to put it in the fridge. Often it's happened to me. And so what do you do? You put it in the freezer. And then you forget about it. <laughs> and then you open up the beer, take it outside, it's okay, you open it up. And you open it up and what happens? Boom! The beer suddenly freezes and the beer bottle breaks. Has that ever happened to anyone in this room? No. Okay, good, okay. We're in Canada, of course. Um, what happened? Well, under high pressure, the beer is a liquid. When you let the top off, a phase transition happens and the beer suddenly freezes in the process, releasing lots of energy. While it was a liquid and under high pressure, it was storing a lot of energy that it could release enough to break the bottle. As our theories of particle physics tell us that as the universe cooled, it's quite likely that it got stuck in a state, a so-called metastable state, where energy was briefly stored in empty space until a phase transition happened, just like in that beer bottle, and that energy was released. But during that short time, 10 to the minus 35 seconds, we think, according to our theories of particle physics, 
During that short time, that energy was stored, so much energy, that it produced something like the energy we see now in empty space, causing the universe to accelerate very rapidly. And we can calculate that during 10 to the minus 35 seconds, it is quite possible for the universe to expand by a factor of 10 to the 90th. Taking a microscopically small closed universe that might have been created at the beginning of time and puffing it up to be so large that it would look flat today. Because just like when you blow a balloon up, it looks flat. When you take a closed universe and you puff it up, it looks flatter and flatter and flatter. So the only the inflation will force the universe to appear flatter. And if inflation didn't happen, the universe would have collapsed in a time of about 10 to the minus 35 seconds. So you can create closed universes from nothing, but the only closed universe that can survive long enough for life to evolve in it is one that essentially looks flat, just like the one we live in. So if you were going to ask, what is the characteristic of a universe that was created from nothing, and by nothing I don't mean just empty space, I mean no space, it would have the characteristics exactly equal to those we see. It would be flat, and by the way, inflation is that theory that predicts those fluctuations that agree identical, identically with the picture I showed you. Giving us great confidence that it actually happened. So everything is completely plausible, and in fact, suggestive. Our universe has the characteristics of a universe if that universe had been created from nothing by normal physical processes. Now, when I say that, that's not good enough. <laughs> because that universe was created by no from nothing without God. <laughs> and for so many people, the definition of nothing is that from which only God can create something. So that's not good enough, because they say, look, you don't have particles, you don't have space, but you have the laws of physics. Well, even the laws of physics themselves may be accidental. Um, is it okay if I go on for five or ten more minutes? Is that okay? Sure. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> good. As long as you want. Yeah. Well, good, because I'm only on for two hours. No, anyway. Um, this, was, this is a discovery we've been driven to, and it's a discovery many of us don't like. I don't. If you ask me, I, I think it's awful, but it may be true. And the reason we've been driven to it is this cosmic coincidence that has driven people crazy. This is a brief history of time. This is the density of matter as the universe expands. It falls with one over the volume. The density of matter as galaxies get further and further apart, that density goes down. This is the energy density of empty space. It remains constant because there's nothing to dilute. If what we have now measured is true, we live right here. At a time when the energy of empty space is about two and a half times the energy of all matter in the universe. The problem with this picture is, it's worrisome, because this means we live at approximately the only time in the history of the universe when those two numbers are the same. At all earlier times, the energy density of matter was much bigger than the energy density of empty space. At all later times, the energy density of empty space is much bigger than that of matter. Why do we live 13.7 billion years at a special time? Copernicus told us it's not supposed to be that way. What? There's nothing special about 13.7 billion years. It's not a fundamental constant of nature in any way. Why should that coincidence happen now and at no other time? It almost sounds religious. <laughs> so people have suggested the answer is the following. Galaxies exist. Why is that? Well, if I made the energy of empty space, say, 50 times bigger, then these two curves would cross not here, but there. But let's see what happens at this time. Well, this is the time when galaxies first formed. If the energy density of empty space had been bigger than the energy density of matter before galaxies had formed, galaxies wouldn't have formed. Because remember, the energy in empty space is gravitationally repulsive. If it had dominated over the energy of matter before galaxies formed, it would have pushed apart the matter before the galaxies couldn't have formed. And, that's, and that, some people have suggested that's telling us something. And it's led to something I call anthropic mania. If there are many universes, and the energy of empty space can vary in each one, it's a random variable, then only in those universes in which not much greater than what we measure today will galaxies form. And only then will stars and planets form, and only then will astronomers form. So the universe is here because astronomers are here to observe. That's why you're all here today. Now, it sounds ridiculous, 
It sounds almost religious. It sounds like this silly fine-tuning that these people seem to think about. It's not. It's just cosmic natural selection. We would be very surprised to find ourselves living in a universe in which we couldn't live. <laughs> that would be worth talking about. It's just like bees and flowers, as I said.